verses 34 through chapter 16, verse 13. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gebeah, in Gebeah of Saul. Now, Samuel's the prophet, Saul's the king. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn? How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked him, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. 
consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has, has not chosen these. So he, asked, so he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was, he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint, this, anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Then Samuel went down to Ramah. Here ends the reading from the Old Testament. So God asks us not to judge based on appearance. And God is able to discern our hearts. Um, what's in them and to and to choose that the early Israel was a theocracy and God uh, chose the kings Our opening prayer is for the holiness of heart uh, Jackie's typed it in but it's uh, 401 in your hymnal uh, But let's we can join please join me in praying um, Number 401 Lord I want to be more holy in my heart Here is the citadel of all my desiring where my hopes are born, and all the deep resolutions of my spirit take wings. In this center, my fears are nourished, and all my hates are nurtured. Here my loves are cherished, and all deep hungers of my spirit are honored, without quivering and without shock. In my heart, above all else, let love and integrity envelop me until my love is perfected, and the last vestige of my desiring is no longer in conflict with thy spirit. Lord, I want to be more holy in my heart. And let the people say, Amen. Amen. I'm going to skip our gospel lesson for today and pick up with our epistle lesson, which is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I, I've added five verses before the ones that I asked Jackie to uh, uh, put in. So we're going to pick up with 1 Corinthians, no, excuse me, not 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. I wrote it down wrong. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning to read at verse 1. Um, and this, the screen is going to pick up at verse 6, so... Um, and so begin at verse one because I realized after reading it we needed we needed the context of the, the five verses before it. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, and there Paul's talking about our body as an earthly tent. Okay, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. And he's not talking about. He's, he's not talking about a building, he's talking about a, a, a resurrection body. We've got the earthly body here, he's using a met metaphorically speaking about a, our re resurrected body as a building from God in the eternal house in heaven. And it's not built with human hands, it's from God. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, in other words, while we are in this human body we have for this, this life, we groan and are burdened. How many of you done, done any, did any groaning getting up this morning? 
<laughs> you know, and there are burdens of this life, are there not? And not all of them are related to our physical being, but some of them are very, uh, very, um, very closely related to how we feel, you know, illness, injury, etc. So while we are in this tent, we grow in our burden because, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. I sometimes think that, that, that God gives us illness and, and maybe even injuries to make us, and, and, the, and the, of course all the stuff out of old age to, to remind us that this life is not all there is, and in some to some extent, to make us long for the next life when we get you know, refurbed bodies, you know, they are they've been rehabbed and they're they're going to be even more they're going to be eternal and immortal and all that. So there's some longing, but longing to be done. Now it is God, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. So this this body that we have is mortal, but the, the resurrection body that. God will grant us as Christians will be immortal. It will no longer be subject to death. Verse 5, now it is God who made us for this very purpose and has given us the spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And here we pick up with the screen. Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not sight. That's our situation right now. We can't see Jesus in the flesh. Um, we are living by faith in him as our Lord. We are confident, I say, and I would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So Paul is saying that you know, he's looking forward to that time when he will die. He's not suicidal, but he's looking forward to that time when when he will die, because that it, it be, then he will be able to be with Jesus in a much more immediate way and have closer fellowship with him than we have in this in this life right now. And so Paul continues. He says, "So we, probably referring to him and his associates, so we make it our goal to please him. Please who? Please Jesus. We make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it." For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us must, might, may receive what is due us for the things done well in the body, whether good or bad. Now let me stay here before we move on to the next verse, that this is, this is not salvation or condemnation based on what we do. We are saved by, by faith in Jesus Christ, Christ by, by grace through faith. But... In my reading about this passage, most scholars think that this 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 judgment referred to here, where we were, is a is a judgment where, as Christians, we are rewarded or fail to receive a reward for what we have done for Christ in His kingdom. Okay, that 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 this is not like the fine. This is not the separation of those who are saved versus condemned. This is an evaluation of okay, how have you done as a disciple? How have you done? as a, a follower of Jesus Christ and here's your you know here's your reward or here's your 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 lack of reward but you're still in you know but there's there's definitely in the in the Bible Jesus talks about that there's you know there's degrees of reward and Paul talks about that here and that's I believe a reference uh, there's a there's a closer reference to that um, or another reference to that elsewhere but anyway continuing since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen, rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he, Christ, died for all, 
that those who live shall, should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though once we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Or an alternative tra translation would be that you are a new creation in Christ. That one, that that uh, translation would be much more familiar to you. Here ends the, the reading from the epistle. May God add a blessing to it. I invite you at this time to stand if you're willing and able to sing Oh How I Love Jesus, number 170. <laughs>
both exciting and, ex and inspiring. Of course, not all Christians change so much, uh, so quickly. Sometimes Jesus does miraculously and instantaneously deliver people from their addictions when they place their faith in him and ask him for help. But other times, Jesus walks alongside addicts to deliver them from their addictions gradually over time if they are only willing to ask for help day by day and rely on his divine help and strength to get them through rather than their own inadequate self-control. And of course, Jesus can, can make as new creatures in Christ by helping us to, to put aside other sins and other habits that uh, have made our lives less than acceptable in God's sight. We all need to remember that Jesus once told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's the, uh, the Bible verse that I tried to paraphrase last week, but wasn't sure if I got it as close as I wanted to. But anyway, from in today's text, uh, Paul's letter says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So how are we to understand that if we haven't seen such dramatic changes in our lives, or if perhaps they have been slower in coming? Well, first of all, we need to understand what it means to be in Christ. Those who are in Christ are people who have been able to believe that Jesus, believe who Jesus truly was and is, and not just see him as a mere human being with no money, no education, no social status, who died on a, a horrible death on a Roman cross, condemned for political treason or as a false messiah like the Apostle Paul once thought Jesus was. Those who are in Christ are those people who have been able to see Jesus not from a worldly point of view, but rather to see, as Paul put it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They have been given and they have been given and received Christ with faith and, and received with faith the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. In other words, people who are in Christ are those who believe that Jesus was and is the Son of God, who is the very image of God in the flesh. And those who are in Christ are those who have placed their faith in him as the one who died on the cross for all our sins in our place so that God would not count our sins against us, but rather against Christ. And therefore, Christ would pay the price for them. Those who are in Christ are those who have been reconciled to God, those who have come to be, become God's friends instead of his enemies because we have received and believed the good news that Jesus died on the cross for us all, and that through faith in Christ, we might be restored to a right relationship with God the Father. Finally, those who are in Christ are Christians, of course. People who believe that God was reconciling the world to himself and his son, Jesus Christ, and that once Jesus had died on the cross, as an atoning sacrifice for all of our sins, that God raised him from the dead and glorified him at his right side. My friends, if we believe that, indeed, if we, when we believe that, then we became new creatures in Christ. If that belief was, ex was accompanied by our sincere repentance of our sins and our placing our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. If we did that, all of our sins were transferred to Jesus Christ and Christ's righteousness, his right relationship with God became ours, his access to God. Jesus got our sins to bear on the cross and we got his righteousness, his access to God the Father. But now our God-given task is to act more and more, more like what we already are in God's eyes, holy and righteous, again, new creatures in Christ. 
New Testament scholar Victor Paul Furnish explains it like this, and I quote, Paul conceives of life in Christ as involving a radical transformation of one's whole situation. The more objective side of this transformation is being drawn under the rule of Christ's love, which has been established through the cross and is present in the powerful leading of the Holy Spirit. So we're, we're drawn into the kingdom of God. That's his, that's his way of talking about becoming part of the kingdom of God or part of the family of God. Furnish continues by saying the more subjective side of it is the total reorienting of one's values and priorities away from the world, which he equates with turning away from oneself and toward the cross, which he explains as turning towards Christ and towards others. Furnish continues, to be in Christ and thus to be a participant in the new creation means to be claimed under the rule of law instituted in the cross and to be liberated from the powers of the present age. And what are some of the powers of the present age that Jesus came to liberate us from? Well, the power of sin, the power of death, and of course, the power of Satan. And we talked about last week how Jesus is, is more powerful than, than any forces of evil. My friends, it is, it is through in and through the church that is in the community of believers in Jesus in which Christ's rule of love is to be most clearly seen and lived out in the world. So as Christians, for example, we are, we are not to judge people or reject them on the basis of, of superficial worldly things like, like national origin or race or sex or color or social or socioeconomic status, education or job status and the like. That is to look at people from a worldly point of view. But God does not evaluate us on the basis of any of those things. Remember the Lord God told the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, which I read, the Lord does not look at the things that people look, that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Yes, Jesus looks to see if we have faith. And if we live out that faith by, by loving people and treating them as our brothers and sisters in Christ. As Jesus said, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. I think that part of acting like a new creature in Christ means that we don't hold people's past mistakes against them when they repented of their sins and placed their, fa their faith in Christ. We are, to, we are to regard them as new creatures in Christ and forgive them for Christ's sake and for our own. And we are to forgive others who haven't yet repented and placed their faith in Christ because we have already been forgiven if we have placed our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Therefore, we are to share the good news with them and pray for them to also become new creatures in Christ and to experience his life-changing grace. Another point that Paul made in 2 Corinthians is that we are not to judge even preachers and evangelists on whether they are whether or not they are polished speakers or can work miracles or have had special revelations from, from God. You may have noticed from the, the, the text that it, Paul was being given a hard time by some of the, the Corinthians who were, who were saying, well, you're not, as, you're not as good a speaker and you haven't had, you know, blah, blah, blah. All these other pastors and, or preachers were, were flaunting their credentials. And, and he said, Paul wanted to teach that, that the most important thing is that, that people preach the gospel correctly and seek to love God and humbly serve Christ and help other people out of gratitude to God for their salvation and, a, and, to have, and that they have a desire to please God. Not that they have great rhetorical skill or have all these revelations of God or you know, special spiritual gifts even. Because if you, 
if you know anything about the context of the of the of the love the love chapter in 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 First Corinthians chapter thirteen, part of the problem that the uh, that the Corinthians were having is that they were being arrogant and prideful about the various spiritual gifts that God had given them, and in their exercising of their spiritual gifts, they were being unloving. They were being arrogant and rude to one another. But remember what Paul said his goal in life was from the passage that I read. He said it was, we make it our goal to please him, please Christ, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Now, Paul did have a revelation where he, uh, of Jesus Christ, he said of the third heaven, and he said he didn't know whether he was in his body or away from it. He didn't know if he was bodily there or if it was just a vision. So that's where we, we get this language where he says, whether in the body or away from it. He's, he's not, we, when, we are, when we are in heaven with God for eternity, I don't think that there is any possibility in which we will not be pleasing Christ. Okay, I think that, I, I think from scripturally speaking that we will be perfected, that we will be, you know, be made sin free, so there will not be sin in heaven, there will not be suffering in heaven, there will not be sorrow, sorrow, sorrow or mourning or death or any of that. See Revelation 21. So, anyway, so this is, so our, he, Paul talks about how his goal is to please Christ, whether he's in the body or out of the body. And Paul also wrote that since Christ died for all, those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So what does it, what does it mean to no longer live for ourselves, but for Christ, who of course was the one who died for us and who was then raised again? Well, according to Furnish again, it means to live for others. How do we live for Christ? Well, we live for others. You see, our, our new identity in, in Jesus Christ must be seen in how we treat other people with love and respect, with care and concern, and of course, how, how we love God. Or as Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. My friends, Christ's love for us should compel us to express love for others in a myriad of ways. We need to be generous with our time, our money, our love, our, our care and concern to express in tangible ways to those in need of material or spiritual and or emotional and psychological support. Even, Jesus said, to the point of being willing to risk our lives to do so. After all, Jesus' command in John chapter 15, verse 12 through 14 was, Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. I want to share a story with you uh, that, that's from 2015. Back in 2015, a man named Henry, and that may not be his real name, had been a a Marxist guerrilla fighter with FARC, F-A-R-C, uh, a, a Marxist guerrilla in, in, in Colombia. When he became a new creature in Christ, some, uh, they, you may not be up on Colombian uh, history, I wasn't, but this, this particular Marxist, Marxist group for years uh, opposed Christianity, assassinated the missionaries, closed churches, and displaced entire Christian communities before they laid down their arms in a political settlement with the Colombian government in 2017, but I read that there's still some, some of these folks that are still continuing the fight. Anyway, Henry became a Christian because some evangelist was willing to risk his life to share the gospel with these FARC fighters. And in Jesus, Henry found someone truly worthy of his allegiance. And he also found forgiveness and freedom for guilt freedom from guilt for all the terrible deeds that he had committed as a, as a soldier. Living out his faith back in, back in Colombia in 2015, Henry started driving a truck into dangerous rural areas of Colombia where these Marxist guerrillas liked to operate. About his work, Henry commented at the time, 
It's very dangerous. I'm very scared every time I leave my truck, but I trust God that this is what he wants me to do. Now, I don't know if Henry survived his, his new work for Jesus Christ, but he was a new creation in Christ, and he was making it his goal to, in life to please Christ and not to live for himself, but for Christ who died for him. After all, Henry knew that Christ will reward him after death for all his efforts on Christ's behalf. And he served Jesus out of love and gratitude for all that Jesus had done for him. There are many, like Henry, all around the world today still risking their lives to spread the good news of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. As I conclude, I invite us all to ask ourselves these questions and ponder them perhaps um, beyond this time together. Are we living for ourselves or for Jesus? Are we trying to please Jesus in how we live? Are we being obedient to Christ's call and the Holy Spirit's nudging? His, the, the nudging of the Holy Spirit telling us to, to do this or visit this person or whatever we might feel the Holy Spirit nudging us to do. What do we need to do in our own lives to act more like the new creatures in Christ that Jesus says we already are through faith in him? And, and I, I, as I look at you, I, I know most of you are, I feel more like old creatures in Christ than new creatures in Christ because you're like, I've been a Christian for how many decades? But this is, this, 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 this is talking about, about our, our, the fact that in, G, that in Jesus Christ, our very nature can be renewed and remade. So what sins and bad habits or addictions are we clinging, still clinging to all these years later in our journey as Christians that we need the Holy Spirit to help us to finally forsake in order to follow Christ more fully and more faithfully. May God, the Holy Spirit, guide you in your, in your thinking and then help us all in living more as God calls us to do. Amen. Our next hymn is Make Me a Captive Lord, number 421 in the hymnal, and Jackie has it on the screen as well.
be in prayer. Gracious God, we know that there are many things on our hearts this morning, and that you know each one of them. You know our every joy, our every sorrow. We pray, Lord, for all those who are grieving this morning. We lift up Jackie's family and her death yesterday. And all those who grieve, Lord, whether the losses were recent or long ago, be their comfort, be our comfort and our strength in times of trial and of grief and help, help us to cling to the promise of eternal life and a new resurrection body in the face of death for all those who have placed their faith and trust in you. And Lord, we pray for all those who are ill, whether it's from COVID or other illness, whether of mind or body. We pray for healing for all those of our church and, and so many others, Lord, worldwide. We pray for the doctors and the nurses and the other healthcare workers that continue to labor on the front lines of this pandemic, even as it winds down some places. Continue to give them strength and courage and, and, and guide them in their ministry of healing. And Lord, we pray that you would pour out your spirit on the church universal, that you might guide us in the paths that you would have us go. Be with the leaders of the nations, that you might guide them in the paths of righteousness and peace and justice, so that more people might be led well rather than poorly. For there are so many that need help, Lord. And we lift up to you the poor, the hungry, those who are, who are struggling financially, all who are struggling in their relationships and who need your help to treat one another with love and respect. We pray for all, this, all the students and, and teachers, the new graduates as they, as they go out into this pandemic world Guide all those who are in need of employment. Help them to find work. Help our, our country as well as all those around the world to recover from this pandemic. And Lord, we pray for its end. We lift up these prayers and many others to you, knowing that you hear them all as our loving Father. And we pray to you now using the words which Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, comfort, and keep you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.